getting hot. Nice graphic. I like that. Well, you can see there's cameras down here. See it? Microphone. They're put. Hey, there we are. <laughs> We're back. You know, they can hear you. Even <laughs> even when that's on, you know, whatever you say, they can hear you. Oh, did you all and they're hear listening. that? They're listening. That's cool. They did. Okay. So, at um, any rate, boy, that little gal was really, really something. And we're going to put that song on. She did a nice job. That was impressive. And, and what, a, what an unusual name. But, yeah, uh, Roosevelt. Ro yeah, R-O-S-E-V-E-L-T. Not Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah. V-E-L-T, Roosevelt. So, at any rate, we're here, and we have Representative Steve Kaiser. And this, uh, he's my representative, and I'm really proud of the things that he's done. And he's, he's been very, very kind to, to come here tonight uh, and, and talk about the Arizona state budget. Now, um, I, I say, you know, pay attention because you're going to be paying the bill. Mm -hmm. So it's a double pay. And so we're going to do that. So tell us what's going on in the Arizona legislature. This is your primary responsibility as a legislator by, by Constitution. This is the one thing they can't duck out on. You got to do it. Right? You mean like the federal government does mm -hmm. every yeah. year? Yeah. <laughs> They never approve the budget, but uh, yeah, we are full swing in budget season right now. So um, I'm gonna take you back to last year uh, when they released early for COVID um, because of sh shenanigans that happened. We, we all know about now. They did a skinny budget, which was about eleven billion dollars. Um, That's pretty skinny. <laughs> yeah. Um, this year, um, it, it looks like the the budget's gonna be around the mid twelves, twelve and a half mm -hmm. billion. Um, what's interesting is at the state level for revenue, we're looking at over 14 billion in revenue, both ongoing and one-time revenues. And so the state has an unbelievable amount of money right now. The rainy day fund has not been touched. That's still got a billion in it. That does not count any of the federal money. The, the, the most recent federal thing is another $12 billion just for Arizona. And this is I think. like COVID money? Yeah, uh, it's just incredibly sad when you think about just one state, they're pumping out that much um, fake currency just for our state, right? And you got 50, 49 other states that are getting this too. So, um, but from the state perspective, if you just look at the state revenues, that's actually, it shows how well we're doing as a state. Um, it's because the sales tax has overperformed year over year compared to um, um, other, other things. And um, through a lot of the, um, we're saving a lot of money through K-12 because of the enrollments being so low several hundred million dollars just in that itself well how how is it that we have so so much money in a year that we had so many businesses that were were closed or not uh functioning at at full capacity yeah so um a big part of that has to do with the sales tax so this tpt revenue was 20 percent higher roughly than year over year the year before the fact that we don't have a service tax like a lot of states sometimes they have a service tax but they don't have a sales tax the service industry nationwide has been hit very hard. The retail side hasn't been hit as hard. So from a taxing policy perspective, Arizona was lucky and fortunate in the sense that we have a sales tax and not a service tax. So that helps. And then the influx of PPP and some of that other um, uh, federal money helped um, you know, keep people employed, which kept them spending uh, and helped with income, income taxes, things like that. So that's part of it. Uh, but what I'm really excited about, we just started the small group meetings, which is the first step in the budget. And then now we're, as freshmen, meeting one-on-one -on -one with the appropriations chair in the House to talk through what's happening with the budget. So the small group is um, the appropriations chair, the majority leader, and the speaker of the House in a small conference room bring in groups of legislators from the House, you know, three to four legislators at a time, brief them on the rough outline of the budget, see what asks they have of uh, budget asks, and then they do that with every group all in the same day. And then they meet with us individually, at, at freshmen anyway, uh, to you know, answer any questions we have and kind of talk through it. Now, because we have this quote unquote surplus, mm -hmm. are we gonna see our, our taxes go down? Yeah, so glad you said that because <laughs> I am so excited about what's coming. We can't share the details right now because obviously you have the House plan, you have the Senate plan, and then you have the governor's, governor's plan. plan. And there's this little shell game that's happening right now that only the leadership of every group is doing. And one of those, it's going to merge into one plan. But every group is talking about some really nice, let's send it back to the people. And I'm so excited about that because it's going to be big. It might be one of the biggest in Arizona history. So. Wow. 
Yeah. Now, how would this how would this actually be uh, undertaken? Would would it be as, as in the form of a check, in the form of future taxes going down? How would yeah, I mean? Question. I know you can't give us I can any give you rough details. ideas. Uh, rough yeah. ideas. So uh, it's going to be income and property tax specifically, and so the focus is going to be on personal income tax. So you know, right now we have about four tax brackets, income tax brackets. It's going to be Try, giving a tax cut to each bracket, ideally. Mm. Um, it's going to be shrinking the number of... Uh, so we won't necessarily be getting a check. Correct. But we like will that. have less taxes to pay at the end of the year. And if you are getting a refund, it would be larger refund? It's going to be lowering your personal income tax and reducing the number, I'd hopefully, of tax brackets. So going down from four to two or four to three, something like that. And then for the property tax, it's going to be uh, the plan is to lower the corporate property taxes. We have a very high corporate property tax at 18 <coughs> percent. And that really um, that hurts even small businesses like me. When I go rent a warehouse and you rent this space, we are paying a high 18 percent property tax on the rentals. So if we can lower the, the corporate property tax, it helps our businesses. Now, well. is that something the state does or does it have to be the county? Uh, that's something the state controls. OK, so that yeah. portion of the property tax is the portion that the state because yeah. every time i look at my property tax bill all as i see is that big school overrides <laughs> and everything and it's just yeah devastating so every there's time nine there's it. nine classes of property tax which is insane it's we have the, one of the most complicated property tax systems mm. in the nation and 18 percent is the highest that's the corporate one residential is 10 percent and then you have all these weird ones like historical homes or agriculture or farming and they all have different percentages right. between uh, five percent and eighteen uh, percent. Some of these special zones that um, you know they have like a five percent rate, things like that. So it's fascinating. Um, Enterpri now, enterprise now, zones. Uh, I think uh, those are at the five percent. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like, or, so yeah. so was this fairly eye opening for you oh. coming in first time and and looking at what's going on and you're like. I never thought it was this complicated. Yeah, yeah, I'm still feel like I'm drinking from a waterfall, right? It's just un <laughs> unbelievable, and the numbers, the numbers are staggering. You know, you're talking about 14 billion dollars, 12 billion dollars. It's hard, hard to comprehend. Oh, that it's kind unreal. Of money. Yeah, and so, and I'm on the appropriations committee, so that's been good training for me, also. And so, we've been seeing a lot more information than the average representative, which is nice. And then, once they actually get all these budgets into bills, budget bills they're going to go through the appropriations committee also um, doesn't yeah you know, it's just going to go through us we're going to ask questions things like that but really the leaders of the senate the leaders of the house and then some select people in the governor's office are the ones that really hash it out and they literally go to a cage in i think it's jlbc or something like that mm -hmm. where they negotiate just you like might you want would. to say what that is jlbc yeah um is uh, go the, ahead uh, the joint legislative budget committee council okay I think, council these are made up of accountants and attorneys um so these are our um there's some representatives from the senate and the house but there's also um some professional uh folks that are very smart with financial um and i'm, I'm butchering the description but uh these are uh, professionals that come up with estimates for budgeting for uh estimating costs of things they work Hand in hand, in hand with the legislature and the governor's office, and you so, can go to azledge.gov and you can click on uh, JLBC and mm -hmm. get lots of good reports. So when you see a tremendous amount of surplus, which is what we're doing, yeah. we have the rainy day fund that's that's protected, uh, but a surplus of a couple billion dollars, right. there must be a, a lot of lobbyists, a lot of uh, external firms coming to you and saying, "Hey, we want a piece of this pie." Right. So, what what is the process that would that you'd go through, and how is it picked and choosed who actually yeah. would get a That's piece a of that pie? Great question. So, I've been told that um, making a budget in lean times is easier than when you're uh, in good times. Right. Right. Because in good times, everybody wants a piece of that pie, like you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so what somebody would do is usually a legend. It's obviously has to come from a legislator, but a lot of it comes from a lobbyist to a legislator to whatever. But when you think about like a road project in a district, right, there's a lot of that happening with different legislators uh, trying to get money. And it's kind of a that's that's hotly debated because you think we have the Arizona Department of Transportation. Why don't we just you right. utilize the process instead of having these little one-off projects here and there. Um, you have um, all kinds of different um, groups that are looking for additional funding. So pay raises for DPS officers and correction officers. Uh, that's been debated back and forth, and that'll probably be somewhere in the budget. Um, 
but um, it's, it's really about all these asks go into a pool. And this is what I found out with the Appropriations Committee, too. We could kill a bill in appropriations. It doesn't mean it's dead because mm. that bill could still survive in the budget and they could bring it back. So mm. it, we killed a road bill one time um, and it was $50 million, but we didn't like it just wasn't presented well. We didn't you know, see how this uh, didn't see the cities and counties chipping in anything. And so we killed it. But we were told later that oh, this the way approach works. This is, can still go back into the budget because a budget becomes a separate bill. All these different there's a health budget. There's um, you know, every department has its own budget. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still learning. There's so much more that I don't know than I do. Um, so Now, what about when it comes to things that have been in there for years, but you know that it's wasteful spending? Uh, is this the time to reconcile, or does it just go through because there's surpluses there? So let's take, um, like, the, the health budget reconciliation bill. Um, from what I understand, and I may be the wrong guy to be talking this level of detail, but there's line items of amounts. And so if you see something like uh, DDD funding with developmentally disabled uh, funding, and it's gonna be a, an amount, um, you can make amendments to that to change it, to lower it, whatever, um, things like that. From what I understand, you can strike things out. Um, um, there's ongoing spending, and then there's one-time spending. And there's been a heavy focus on just doing one-time spending because we have this surplus you know, this is after you take out the tax cut that's happening, right? Uh, because that takes care of a lot of the surplus. And so then you've got some one time funding and then you've got ongoing. So they, they have to balance that as far as what the asks are. Some some legislators may ask for one time funding. Some legislators may ask for ongoing funding. Um, and so they have to put it into the matrix and decide what's the highest priority. And you have to get other legislators to go to the leaders in your chamber and say, hey, we're with Steve. We really want this thing or I'm with this guy and I really support his ask. Um, because they want to see what's do, do you have supporters? It's just your idea that you think is a good idea. Right. So um, I hope that. Boy, helps. it just seems like a big jigsaw puzzle that has to be put together, and show a nice picture. You know, because yeah. you're just putting these pieces together, and you may look at it. And, oh, I don't. I don't know what that is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's it's got to be it's got to be uh, heavy on your heart right now. I think it's why mentorship is so important too. So leaning on the legislators that are veteran legislators leaning on the JLBC staff, too, because they've been there a long time. Um, and really, the, the most fascinating part for me is the shell game of the House, the Senate, and the governor. And the first group to pair up wins, mm. right? Because if you have kind two groups to pair up, little game that's yeah, played. <laughs> they can force this other party to do something. And so uh, I've been I, I'm kind of learning as, I, as I'm going, obviously, and I'm kind of at, obviously, the lower. Well, who, who is your mentor? Oh, uh, gosh, there's, there's several that I kind of look up to. Um, I like Cobb a lot. Um, I think Toma's good, too. Um, you know, I think about some of those, those folks that have been there. You know, they've only been there like maybe eight years, too. It's not a long time. Yeah. But um, I'm trying to think of who else. But you have a budget every year. So if you're yeah. there eight years, you've had eight budgets behind you. Yeah, yeah. They've seen it. They've seen the show several now, times. Now, one of the things that I'm kind of interested in um, – you know, we talk about the two political parties. Essentially, that's what we have in the legislature, is two parties. I mean, we kind of left and right in both areas. But it seems that, to me that we have a, certain parties have, uh, like, social issues. Let's, uh, let's be honest about it. It's most likely the Democrats. And, and Republicans are more business-oriented mm -hmm. to stimulate business through tax reduction uh, you, do you see that at oh play? yeah oh my gosh any 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 um like th they're gonna the democrats are gonna lose their mind about this tax cut it's gonna be kind of fun to watch um the property tax too especially because it's business focused they're gonna lose their mind over um and when you really get into the details of some of the plans um <laughs> they're gonna anything that they see it as a um a a cut to the state it's a total ideological mind shift change right we see it as give the money back to the people they it, see it as it's, 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 theirs. Right. it's theirs it is our money right but <laughs> this is the fundamental difference right they see it as a cut to the state we don't see it that way now there was a proposition that passed <laughs> and uh it it had to do with tax revenue does it rhyme with uh, 208 
Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know that there's some legal challenges on yes. that because the really the legislature is, is who can tax. Uh, I can't tell my neighbor you're going to pay more tax because you do this. So um, is that being discussed now? Oh, What's yeah. going on with that? Yeah. So that's where it gets really interesting with the uh, Prop 28 because we know there's a court challenge right now. So it's possible that 208 gets thrown out. It's not likely, but I'm, we're all hoping it does get thrown out, right? Um, I don't know if you heard about J.D. Mesnard's bill around uh, Prop 208, creating a new income tax rate for small businesses that file as S. Corps I have LLCs. heard some discussion. I don't know. This is an amazing in. answer to Prop 208. It's so exciting because it's, it's a beautiful solution. So Now, hold on. Before yeah. you go on this, explain real briefly what Prop 208 did yeah. to... It creates a three and a half percent surcharge. And it on circumvents the legislature as well. Uh, it did, yeah, yeah uh, by the did, vote of the yeah. people. Yeah. 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 Did, yeah. So it creates a three and a half percent surcharge on top of our top tax rate, which was four and a half percent. So it essentially creates an eight percent tax rate for our top bracket, which wow. is like double all of our neighbors except for California. And what happens is all of our small businesses, our most successful small businesses, file as S Corps, LLC, partnerships, and sole proprietors, which means all of them get hit on the income tax. So they would be paying 8% instead of 4.5%, which would devastate. Which is, the, it's a game changer. Yeah, you, I mean, you'd leave the state. Leaving, yeah, sure. you'd leave the state because of um, that. And so what, and remember the proponents of 208, they just completely lied through their teeth. They said, this is not a business tax. This will not tax business. This is only for super wealthy. And it's for the children. Right. <laughs> That's right. And so Mesnard's bill says, okay, yeah, 208, all that stays right there. We're going to create another tax bracket over here at four and a half percent. That's going to be only for S corps, LLCs, sole proprietors, and <laughs> and you can choose that if you want, or you can stay in this. Right. And oh my gosh, you should have seen the Ways and Means Committee when this was brought up. <laughs> they were losing their mind. We're like, we're like, wait, wait a second. We said you said this wasn't a, a tax for um, small businesses, <laughs> and the JLBC did an estimate. So originally, Prop 28 was supposed to bring in 800 million dollars or something. Well, now with JD's uh, bill that creates this other thing over here, it goes from 800 million to 200 million. So that tells you how much money they were going to be taking wow, from small businesses, wow. over 600 million dollars. And after after all this COVID stuff, to to put this burden right. on small businesses it's so again, unreal. It's, that are it's, struggling, it's, yes. already struggling. It's unconscionable. And and you know, Ray, a four percent. Can you imagine an additional four percent? What that does to your profit margin? I mean, well, that, that's are, all profit margin. I was going to say gonna many of them are thing. just marginal to start with. Right. Mm -hmm. And at 4%, I mean, that could be the difference between staying in business and going out of business. Representative Kaiser, you've had small businesses before, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I own one right now. Yeah. And I was just shocked at how little Democrats in this committee specifically knew about how small businesses are taxed. Do they not work? Do they not have a small business? Has nobody ever taken a chance? You have a small business. I have right. a small business. It, it's almost as though they just think that it's unicorns and, and puppy dogs, you know, dancing I know, on, on I rainbow know. clouds. I, I don't get it. That's well said. So there is it's true. <laughs> so there's one Democrat on there who's just has no clue about businesses at all. And it's just so obvious. And there's one Democrat on that committee that said that her and her husband have a small business. And I tried to pull a question out of JD about, you know, talk us through net profit because mm -hmm. you guys know about net profit. It's not the money you take in your pocket and go home with. It's money that you've stayed left in the business to cover things like payroll and gas right, and right. labor and all this. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, little piddly things yeah. like payroll. <laughs> <laughs> and they just and I and they just don't understand that um, net profit counts as income towards these taxes, but it's not income. And so, you know, it's just it's just a classic all the time. Tax the rich pay their fair share. Um, they have no idea what they're talking about. So I, I feel like every legislator should take a class in you know, a basic P&L management or understanding business. Or economics. You yeah. Know? Well, you, this pay you have... your fair share concept that came about many years ago, I do not understand I don't know. If, it. If you have a degree in economics and you don't know what a garbage disposal is, <laughs> something is very wrong. Well, the, the one thing that's, that I've always found troubling about this, and, and, and it's, you know, we, we say income tax, you pay income tax. Well, quite frankly, revenue, it's a revenue tax, not an income tax. Businesses pay income, you pay revenue. What I mean by that is 
a corporation can write off a lot of things or any any private business that's on some of the structures mm -hmm. business structures you talked about but i pay my taxes on revenue not on income because what is income income is the difference between revenue less expenses is mm -hmm. income mm -hmm. and so I spend all the money I make every year, <laughs> so I have no income. Right. I have all kinds of expenses that I pay for, and so I shouldn't pay any tax because I have no income. Mm -hmm. But I do have revenue, and that's what they tax individuals on. It's the internal revenue service, mm. not the internal income tax right. service. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that just by going out and buying something, you're paying tax on it. You certainly are. You know? so, uh, it's 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 kind of a misnomer where they would say, look, you don't pay any taxes. I see, I see your tax report. You don't pay any taxes. It's like, uh, no, I pay taxes when I fill up my gas. I pay taxes when I go right. buy something. You know, you are you're paying taxes. Well, I'll tell you something, Representative Kaiser, you'll get a kick out of this. And I heard this in the last day or two. It was an advertisement on, a, on one of the radio shows, the local shows. And they said, this product will cost you, let's see, $99.95. Then it says sales tax extra. Well, who pays the sales tax? It's not the business. Consumer. Right? <laughs> it's the consumer. So you're yeah. buying something for ninety nine ninety nine. Plus a small and processing fee. <laughs> and you're paying the tax as well. So all this concept, and I've I've argued. I'm going to have somebody on this show coming up, and it's going to be a Democrat, and they, he does uh, KFNX. I used to debate him, and he always did the following. You know, he said those big corporations, mm -hmm. they're so greedy. You know, we got to tax them all the more. They shouldn't make those obscene profits. They're still going to make the obscene profits because guess who's going to pay They're the tax? They're just going to pass the it on. Is. That's right. That's right. <laughs> They'll so still make no the concept. obscene profit. Yeah. All right. So the budget. So are you in the beginning phases? Yeah, the middle good phases? Question. Very the phases? beginning phase. So okay. um, I've and heard. And how long this, is this process? Take? Um, I've heard it about four to six weeks. Wow. Yeah. Um, it'll be more complicated because there's more money. So there's going to be more bargaining going on, from what I understand. But the first step was the small group meetings, and then it's the individual meetings, and then um, it just they'll start they're doing negotiating now. So there's already uh, we've seen uh, evidence of the Senate kind of lining up with the governor's office, which is not a good sign for the House. So we've got to you know we're going to start getting in there more more it looks like and get more aggressive. Does the governor give you a a heads up on where he's leaning? I think that's through his budget proposals at the beginning of the year. I think okay. that's where that, but I'm not for sure. I'm still um, kind of learning about that. But I, I, And and how how close do the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate, they're working together? So I, it, it's, I don't know for sure, but you've got your small team in each chamber, which consists of either the Speaker and the President, and then the approach chair and the approach chair. And then usually the majority leader, majority leader, and maybe the vice chair of approves in each. So that's kind of the small group in each house that's in, involved. And it can change from year to year depending on what leadership wants, I guess. Um, but it, it feels more like the two approach chairs are talking to each other okay. more than the two, than more than the president and the speaker. And I don't know if that's the case. It just, from the conversations I'm picking up, that's what it seems like. So do you find that within the legislature, some people just get it? They get it. They know the process. And, and some people are just kind of out in la-la land, and they really think it just happens. Yeah. Um, don't, don't, don't mention any names. Yeah, no. I, and I'm, I'm just wondering if I'm not even qualified to answer that because I'm still, you know, learning so much. And I'm... You know, but there's a point of the somebody way, wanting if you to know more. On, if you haven't yeah. caught on yet... Uh, uh, Representative Kaiser is this is his first term so this is his first Budgets, attempt to yeah. balance a budget yeah. uh, for for the state of Arizona he'll get better at it yeah but uh, this first time has got to be and you know one of the things that you've already kind of hinted at there are people there that say oh well, we have the money let's spend it yeah. right it's it's like saying I've got a dollar in my pocket I better spend I it right like it's gonna right. burn a hole in my pocket no well, maybe I, th I, I think could I, save some of it I right. think I told you that when Get I was back. being interviewed when I ran for Senate uh, state Senate that she said there's a big rainy day fund how do you intend on spending it <laughs> and I answered I said I I don't that's not my job yeah. as a legislator it's 
It's to make it as easiest for everybody to fulfill the American dream. That that's my job. It's not to spend people's money. How do you, how do you plan on spending it? Yeah, is that what I a question? Seen, what yeah, a I remember seeing question, must have been on Twitter yeah. or something uh, before COVID and everything. Um, everyone was um, uh, giving the governor a hard time about that billion dollar rainy day fund. They're like, you need to put that in education. It's like education is a five and a half to six billion dollar a year enterprise. And we you would, spend a lot on education. Uh, all, it's the biggest, it's the biggest, 45% of our state budget is on education. The biggest by far. The next biggest is $2 billion to our Medicaid program. Well, if wow. you remember when, when Ken wow. Bennett was the Secretary of State, yes. he had the shoe box. Yes, a Kleenex box. The Kleenex boxes, and he showed the budget. And boy, after a time, he said, do we spend money on anything other than education? <laughs> did you see what Justin and I did in the campaign? No. We did a Ken Bennett 2.0. And this is in the middle of COVID, <laughs> so we did toilet paper rolls. <laughs> <laughs> we did five, five toilet paper rolls for, uh, that was uh, great. And they were very valuable at the time. I know, that's what we were joking about. <laughs> By the way, speaking of Ken Bennett, guess who's going to be our guest on Wednesday? Mm. That You mean on Fighting, Fighting back? back. Ken, Ken Bennett will be here. He's going to be here. Will he bring the tissue boxes? I don't think so. We so should ask we've him. We've got to bring our own. <laughs> we should have him here for him as he sits down. Yeah, I'll call down him right tomorrow and tell him to ship a case of Kleenex boxes here. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really exciting as well. But, you know, we get back to this whole concept. The knowledge that people have over money uh, is, is, is really devastating because, first of all, money is personal property and it grows on trees and it grows on trees yeah. everybody the money that, that i own is my property ta-da ta-da mm -hmm. you know you don't have the right to spend it <laughs> you know i mean i will spend it only through the process that we we have well you look at the it's founding not, father documents and and income tax was never one of their no priorities no I, I think we need to get more and more comfortable saying out loud on a regular basis in conversation with neighbors and friends income tax is theft and that'll be shocking to a lot of people when they first hear that but then when you really think about it income tax is theft this is money that you earned doing some kind of productive means or labor exactly um you, you there's all, income tax should not be a form of taxation and and that and therein lies the other part of the the equation you know i just said it's personal property and what does it do it represents production on mm. your part mm -hmm. yeah it's in your life that you your have, life force mm -hmm. that you've you invested made. yeah you've you invested have, your you time said, you've invested time and effort taking, yeah. and in a lot of cases you've turned your dollars into mm -hmm. dollars and more dollars mm -hmm. which is always advantageous but but it doesn't seem like they teach that uh even in economics you know i've had when I was doing economics, I don't know if you've heard of Kinsey, and you're a young man, but you've heard of Kinsey. And, yeah. and the concept, that Ray, you're, you're a little older, but you remember, no, you're not older. You're still the same age you were 20 years ago. Okay, but what According Kinsey- According to the and, candles on my cake, yes. But what the Kinsey and economy said, gee, if the government, in bad times, if the government stimulates the economy by infusing uh, cash into an economy, and it does it in bad times. Wow, just think if we infuse it into the economy in good times, it'll even be better. Well, no, in good times, mm. the economy runs itself. Right. And, and that's why the tax cuts, you know, pe I know there are people that still say you can't cut taxes and bring more money into the coffers. Yes, you can. Absolutely. It's been proven so many times. That's, yeah. Yeah. I know it's such an interesting debate that we still have that debate. So, Representative Kaiser, um, the budget is main right now, and I know you came on to talk about the budget, but what about some of the other bills that are mm -hmm. happening right now? Are they pushed aside during this time? Do they happen simultaneously? What's going on with some yeah, of the other Yeah, great question. Bills? So, we still have bills to pass, um, but they're slowing down the bill process. So, we did a, a handful today. We'll do a handful tomorrow on the floor. There's no more committee work. That's been done for about a week, two weeks now. Um, so it's, it's, everything's third read stuff. It's all Senate bills that we're third reading on the floor. Uh, but it's all, um, they're going to hold the controversial bills because these are leveraged too, right? Like if, if you say that you're not going to vote for the budget, you, we need all 31 Republicans to vote for the budget, right? So if you say, I'm not on the budget unless you put my bill in the budget or unless I, unless you cut this or get this, then we can say, well, we've got your really important bill here. So if you want it to hit the floor, you need to get in line kind of thing. Right. So that's a piece right. of leverage. Um, 
that, that's out there. But I'm very happy to report that Ron's bill that he submitted to me about the death records and SOS, that bill was signed by the governor a couple weeks ago. So. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> Ron Lutter, so this, gi give, us, give us a rundown of exactly what the bill said. Well, you know, I, I've even had the opportunity to go on national radio, and this bill was even discussed by the New York awesome. Times. Did awesome. you know that? I did not know yes, that. Yes, the New York Times oh, even addressed this bill. And kudos to you. He's the one who shepherded this through. And, and folks, I want to tell you, this is the concept that our founding fathers had. He represents me. He doesn't just represent the ideas that he has. He right. has to represent the ideas right. that everybody mm -hmm. has. And collectively, we say, I don't want to be down at the legislature for four months, but you do. <laughs> I'll give you some things that I think you need mm -hmm. to work at. All right. So tell us, about, so tell us about tell us about the bill. At any rate, during this last election, and this is this was so simple. I, I I'm almost embarrassed <laughs> to say, you know, wow, you know, everybody's going. Yeah, when Ron, did, when did does it, the confetti and the balloons <laughs> fly down? That's what <laughs> right. I want to know. Ticker tape parade. Because we haven't announced what this it, yet. What it, what, it, what it was essentially is, you know, I'm looking at the results of the election. I'm thinking, how is it that so many dead people voted? It's very difficult. I know. It's very <laughs> difficult. They've got to do a lot of work to get those people to the That's polls. Right. Six, they they got to be and so I, about standing I spoke six feet with away. Representative Kaiser, and I said, you know, this is crazy that all these people are voting. This is in December, November time frame, I think, right? Yeah, right after you were elected. You weren't right, even sworn uh, in yet. Right, right, right. <laughs> and I said, we need to do something about this. And, and it's, you know, it's so simple. You just require that the, that the documents that come in, death certificates come in, and they go to the uh, Bureau of uh, Vital Statistics. And, of course, you say, okay, you've got so much time. You've got to send them to the recorders. The recorders have so much time. Uh, and the language was such, there's, I, I, I wanted tough language, but it's not legalese. I wanted must, but that's not, it's shall and may. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, they may do this. That means they may not, they may do it. But they shall do it. They, sh they don't have the shall not do it. <laughs> so it's shall. Mm -hmm. And when it's shell, they've got to do it. And thank God he shepherded through. And, so, and it, it so, so, it, so it says that once the a Bureau of Vital Statistics gets a death certificate, that they have a certain amount of time to pass it on to the recorders, and the recorders will then take them off the voter roll. Off the voter rolls. Is that, is that correct? It's, yes. Um, it's the Secretary of State has to remove them from the voter registration database when they compare it to the annual DHS death record oh, report. Okay. So right. before they didn't have to remove anybody, so they, that's why it was a may. So this is making it a shall. And, that's awesome. And yeah, it was, it was so easy. Congratulations to you. Is that your first bill? That was my first bill submitted and first bill signed. That's yeah. awesome. I had 10 bills total. And, and let me tell you, it was so neat. He shepherded this thing through, and every time it passed a hurdle, he'd text me. Yeah. <laughs> and it, the, the, the first one I remember, he says, Wow, it went through unanimous. He took a picture of the screen that has the scores on it. Wow. You know, voted. And then all of a sudden, oops, one Democrat changed their mind. Yeah. <laughs> so I got 59 yeas Virtual and voter. One, <laughs> 59 yeas and one nay. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, that was, that was a good one. That's a, such a great story, too, for public policy and citizen engagement and representative government. It's just such a great story for exactly how, how it's should supposed work. to be that's the way our yes. government's supposed yes. to work because right, right. we the people right. work through our representative our elected representatives who then present this to the body as a whole mm -hmm. and to the governor and say, how, did, how did your one bill about the national chocolate day did that go through um no but it got a little chocolate here on the <laughs> shirt that I've spilled it'll be next year we'll in. run it again <laughs> oh no so at any rate uh wow um, so, so uh, the next couple of weeks, focusing on the budget yeah. as well as throwing a Take handful a of bills that are uh, yeah. going through, and then uh, when does the session end? So, the session will end, from what I understand, once a budget is agreed upon and voted on, and so that's when it starts getting into the really late nights, the overnights, is when the negotiating is getting really tense. Maybe you've got a couple holdouts on the budget, um, and then once everybody agrees and you got everybody on board, then it's done. And then that's the end of the session. Yeah. And what are you shooting for? What date? Uh, that's probably mid-May. So. so for anybody out there in the viewing audience who wants to get in touch with Representative Kaiser, uh, and if you have some ideas like Ron Lutters did as well, 
Uh, for this year, everything's done. Correct. But we can do something for next year. And, and I know a lot of people you. have nice, some All great right. ideas for I've next year. I've got one coming up that I want to talk to. And about. I know that they still have a lot of election integrity bills, some transparency yeah. bills that that are, I don't know if they're waiting to the end because they're so, quote, controversial and we have the audit coming up. And I know that that's going to be a determining factor on yeah. which direction to move. But there's a lot that are just kind of sitting there idle right now. Well, there's a lot that unfortunately died in a drawer. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. This is when mm -hmm. leadership or whoever, a committee chair, doesn't want to hear a bill. And they stick it in a drawer and it dies. And so there was a lot of... Um, Can really, we revive them? Um, not any... I think we're out of time for strikers. They could possibly try to put it into the budget. Um, the... It's, it's, it's a very risky move because it's not, it's very much frowned upon to put policy into a budget, into the budget bill, because it winds up causing a lot of, um, but you could go that route if you wanted to. It's just very, it's very dicey. It's not, it's not an easy route, but strikers are difficult too, but that's a route. Um, you can move your bill out of the committee if the chair won't hear it. That's what I did with my election, to, uh, with my school board bill. I was originally had it in the education committee. Then I realized they were not going to be supportive of it, and I wouldn't get it out. So I moved it from the education to government committee, got it out of government. Um, and so, but unfortunately, we, I, you know, we had a lot of good bills that didn't really see the light of day, which is a little frustrating. What was the school board bill that you moved on? Yeah. And was that, did that pass? No. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what was it? Because we just, we want to brag about you being on the show. So oh, I appreciate it. So I worked with some parents in Paradise Valley School District who were incredibly frustrated with the school closures. This is something I'm very frustrated with. Um, and, I, and I don't feel like parents have a voice in the school boards. And I don't feel like school boards listen to the parents at all. And so I wanted to create a bill that would make parents have more power and control and have the school boards listen to them. So it consisted of uh, term limits for school board members. It consisted of online signature for recall and to get on the board to help more people get on run for school boards. Um, it consisted of having the elections be all five members of the school board get reelected at the same time. None of the staggered stuff because the staggered stuff creates a culture of protection for the incumbents. Right, right. And um, uh, I'm forgetting there's, there's five points to it. But I had to negotiate down to get it out of the government committee, and I negotiated poorly. I should have thought a little, I, I, I made mistakes there. And so when it got to the floor, um, all I had left was online signature for recall was left of the bill. Wow. And so I, because I had to negotiate down all those other points just to get it to that point. And, um, and I was, I, I negotiated poorly, so that's what was left, and I couldn't get enough Republicans on board. Some Republicans, which was disappointing to me, a, one Republican, this is how it happens, kind of like rumor mill, then everyone gets scared or excited. One Republican said, well, if we pass this bill to do online signature recall for school board members, then they could pass a bill next year to do online signature recall for us as legislators. I said, so what? If you're doing a poor job, you should get recalled. Right. And why would you worry about making it easier for people to recall you? If you're doing a bad job, people spoke and they want to get rid of you, get rid right. of you. Um, but that, that person scared enough other Republicans. And so when it, and, and leadership came up to me, they said, Steve, I don't think you got the votes on this bill. I was like, I know I don't have the votes, but I want to put it to the board because I like to see things all the way through. We're going to charge into the barbed wire. We may get chewed up and it may be the end of the story, but we're going to charge in and that's his military. Yeah. Background. <laughs> so, so would this got have affected, votes. was this, would this have affected all of the school boards yeah. or just PV? All state. Wow. And so in the interim, I've got a few projects I'm going to be working on in the interim. I'm going to come up with a better school board reform bill because we're going to stay after it. I, th I think that's uh, I think that's very admirable and it's a it's a huge hurdle. Yeah. But I think it's necessary. And it's such a critical form of government a school board. we got to get more people on the yeah. school board and watching yeah. the school boards. Yeah, okay, I hear the music. Yes, bum, it is. Bum, bum. Salsa. Wow, what an exciting show tonight. Oh, this is great. Yeah, I, I really appreciate Two it. Two representatives from the state on your show and the lovely And then one in the Roosevelt. audience. Uh, and and a senator yes. in the audience yeah. as well. Okay, well, we're, we're running out of time here. We're going to be back Wednesday on Fighting Back, so just stay tuned on Wednesday night. And, and thank you, Representative Kaiser. Thank Kaiser. you, sir. Thanks. Good Always you. a pleasure. Yes. We'll see you real soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. DeSante for running the show tonight.